Hello and welcome. My name is Alana Gordon. I'm a reporter at The World covering global health. This is a Facebook Live Q&A about the coronavirus pandemic, more surges, growing concern. And with me is Yonatan Grad, an assistant professor in the Department of Immunology and Infectious Diseases at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Yonatan, thanks for joining us for this conversation. Thank you for having me. Um, and so you can post your questions for us on Facebook at Forum HSPH, or you can email them to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. This Q&A is jointly presented by the Forum at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the World from PRX and GBH. We are doing this on Zoom through Facebook. To start, the number of new cases of COVID-19 for context in the United States it pretty much peaked in July, declined for about two months. Then last month, the situation, it changed and not for the better. Since mid-September, we've been seeing new cases steadily mounting, um, breaking things down at the state and local level. We've observed dramatic surges in states like Utah, Wisconsin, North and South Dakota. Um, and those places are far exceeding the number of cases they saw during the summer peaks. Even states that have been holding the virus in check are seeing lo local surges here in Massachusetts. Boston recently entered the red zone, which is the state's highest risk of emergency um, or highest category. And in New York, areas of Brooklyn and Queens have emerged as new hotspots too. And that's prompted leaders there to reimpose restrictions. So, Yonatan, we've been expecting more surges, um, even what some have called a second wave. Are you seeing that happening? Is this it? From a purely descriptive perspective, yes, absolutely. You know, we had one wave with a rise in cases, as you described, and then many places were able to uh, flatten the curve through social distancing, masking, and other types of interventions, bringing those case numbers down. And now as we see them start to climb again, this is, from, again, from a descriptive perspective, a second wave. But I'd like to emphasize that unlike uh, waves in nature, um, like waves in the ocean, uh, we actually have the ability to control these waves. Really, they're, they're a reflection of our choices and behavior uh, individually and as communities. Um, th these choices really shape uh, the extent of disease spread uh, through our populations. So when you think about that, why, what are some of the drivers of why you're, we're now experiencing a rise in cases in parts of the United States, for example? Yeah, so, so we know that the virus can spread uh, so long as there are sufficient numbers of susceptible individuals to sustain spread and connection between infectious and susceptible individuals. So, um, and, and we have a good sense of what the risks are for accelerating that transmission. Um, you know, the, it's a respiratory virus, it transmits through the air, things like close contact, poor ventilation, activities like shouting and singing, all of these, those that generate droplets and aerosols, these increase the risk of transmission. So where we're starting to engage in those behaviors more than we had been, and there's connection with infectious individuals, we should expect to see uh, that there will be spread. So um, this also means, of course, that we know what we can do to help suppress the spread of COVID-19. So social distancing, masking, uh, meeting outdoors rather than indoors, and then really coupling that with extensive testing uh, as well as uh, contact tracing, case identification, and so on. Um, things that have been demonstrated to work. Uh, it's why we were able to flatten the curve before. And in fact, some countries even haven't seen uh, a second wave. Th those, those kinds of efforts we know work. Um, I want to I want to get to that about other countries, but just in building off of you were talking about um, a need for testing surveillance. Um, you had an op-ed in the Washington Post co-authored recently um, that there isn't enough testing and surveillance data to really be figuring out the ways to tighten and loosen restrictions. So, what are the gaps in those that testing and monitoring right now that prevent that level of um, informed policy? Yeah, so, so we, we have made big strides with testing. There's certainly more testing now, uh, but um, there was, uh, we had a really slow start uh, and that put us behind the eight ball uh, and we have really not emerged from uh, that, that situation yet. We, we don't have, we, 
just don't have enough testing across the country. Uh, and as we've heard in press reports regularly, the turnaround time uh, for getting results from tests continues to be far too long uh, to have the impact that testing can have. Right? So being able to identify cases rapidly and then figure out who else is at risk in the absence of being able to do that, um, or having these long delays, uh, we would expect new cases to start off uh, new transmission chains and outbreaks. So really the, the insufficient testing for broad community surveillance, uh, I think is, is continues to be a big challenge and is one of the reasons why we, we haven't been able to really, uh, in many places, get a, get a handle on the, uh, the pandemic and, and help drive down the numbers. When you look at globally, worldwide, how does what's happening in the United States fit into this context of what, what, where is the world at in this pandemic? And as we see surges happening in the United States, where, what else is happening around the globe? Yeah, so we're, we're seeing the, um, the, the choices that governments and, and communities are making play out in very different ways. In some places, the initial efforts uh, for strict quarantine and isolation together with massive testing really helped stop transmission. China, for example, uh, had the first cases, right, and had this wave in Wuhan, but they were able to suppress it with fairly strict measures that they've been able to, you know, where uh, now life there has returned somewhat back to normal uh, as they continue to maintain extensive surveillance. Other countries like Israel uh, did a good job initially in suppressing spread, but then let up on those efforts and we're seeing massive spread in Israel now leading to a second lockdown, right? So having to use this broad measure of community quarantine as a way to try to slow disease spread. And we're seeing similar kinds of uh, up and down introduction of uh, social distancing and other types of interventions, lockdown interventions in different places. In Spain, uh, there was actually just recently a, a, a legal battle about this, but the federal government wanted to uh, introduce a, a more uh, uh, restrictive measures in Madrid. Uh, in Paris, more restrictive measures have been introduced. Scotland, the same, some towns in Northern England to try to control what has been uh, rising case numbers in each of those places. But other countries like South Korea, Singapore, uh, they've been able after initial uh, their initial efforts, basically they have occasional blips, but they've been able to, to keep the numbers low. And New Zealand uh, aided of course, by being a kind of island country initially actually uh, it, it was able to remove uh, COVID-19 spread uh, almost totally. And, and after, again, an introduction, uh, now has yet again uh, almost essentially eradicated spread uh, in their country. So the different choices that countries make really have had huge impacts on uh, the trajectory of the pandemic in, uh, in their populations. And yet still, I mean, this week, uh, the director of the World Health Organization said about more than people had expected, about 10% of people may have um, been exposed to the virus, but that still leaves like 90% of the global community susceptible. And so it seems like choice is one part of it, but it still seems like, do you see this as still in the beginning of things when you think about how many people out there um, yeah, that's that's right. I mean, I I, I think it, it it is still um, uh, in in towards the beginning for for precisely the reason you mentioned. So much of the population remains susceptible uh, that um, you know the, the possibility of continued spread and continued struggle with the pandemic uh, for uh, for some time into the foreseeable future. I think is is right, and this is you know one of the reasons why so much emphasis has been placed on. Uh, innovation um, medically, right? So coming up with new therapies uh, so that we can treat people and reduce the severity of disease and vaccines uh, to help prevent disease. So, um, you know, people talk about uh, the fact, well, you know, if everyone's gonna get it anyway, why does it matter? Why are we doing these kinds of interventions? And I think the advances that we've seen with um, new therapeutics 
Uh, so from, or, or the use of old therapeutics to help reduce the severity of disease, so like the use of dexamethasone, for example, or new drugs like remdesivir, newly applied here, uh, or the, the monoclonal antibody cocktail that we've heard so much about over the past couple of weeks. When You're we talking about the treatments that President Trump has received. Exactly. So, so as we develop these new tools, uh, we're able to better treat individuals. So all of these efforts to help suppress the spread of the virus means that it's giving us a time, a time frame, a window in which to develop the new tools to, to help uh, uh, reduce the mortality, reduce the severity of disease, or, or even prevent it as we get effective vaccines. So these efforts, e even if uh, large fractions of the population remain susceptible, these efforts to help um, develop these new tools uh, can have massive benefits in the longer term, even, even if uh, uh, we, see, we see continued spread. Just, um, there's some questions coming in from online, so I want to be sure that we get to some of this too, but I have more follow-ups as well. Um, in co contextualizing around the availability of treatments, where we're at in the pandemic, seeing new surges, for example, in the United States, this question from online um, is, you know, in the spring, we resorted to a lot of broad shutdowns, um, and that was one of the only we weapons readily available, I guess you could say, in our arsenal, to use that sort of metaphor. Are we now better prepared to contain outbreaks without resorting to those kinds of sweeping restrictions? Um, and we've also seen this kind of politically play out in the de vice presidential debates yesterday about how this is being handled and how to handle it moving forward. Should there be more widespread restrictions and things like that? Uh, so, so uh, I, I think um, you know that, that, that one of the challenges, uh, of course, is that um, you know at the beginning we had at the beginning of the pandemic our understanding of disease spread, risk areas, what kinds of activities were risky uh, was still very much in its infancy. And we've advanced uh, in our understanding of what types of activities uh, are uh, can contribute to risk and then what we can do therefore to reduce that risk. And I think that's, that's where, again, we return to these ideas of limiting uh, um, interactions among groups, indoors with loud speaking and so on. These kinds of activities that we know promote transmission being able to address those, promote masking and so on, I think uh, continue to be interventions that can help us um, uh, avoid the, again, the blunt instruments of community lockdown and target them, particularly as we get better and more testing and are able to do more surveillance, we can identify those populations that are at highest risk uh, of continued spread or where we're seeing the most spread and, and try to focus. So advances both in our understanding of transmission uh, and uh, advances and there's again continued need uh, for advances in uh, availability of testing I think can all help us avoid uh, the, the lockdown uh, scenario. But if we get back to a situation where there's just completely uncontrolled spread, uh, that you know, continues to be uh, a looming possibility, knowing um, the, the huge challenges associated with it. Um, oh, in terms, I'm sorry. I was gonna just ask, um, and following up from that, this question is from um, uh, Andrea from the World's Facebook page. Are these slow turnaround times right now for testing results? Is that a specifically United States sort of thing or what can be learned from other countries? Yeah, so, so I think um, there are some areas in the United States where turnaround times uh, are very slow. It's not even uh, everywhere in the US. I think, again, um, uh, availability of testing, availability of reagents, increasing manufacturing, increasing the clinical lab capacity to be able to run these tests, all, all of those things can be addressed. You know, you, you mentioned the political uh, situation and of course the debate yesterday and, and uh, continuing issues um, uh, around uh, uh, making this into, a, I think, a central issue for the election. And I, I think it deservedly is one. Uh, there was recently, uh, just yesterday actually, a, a, an editorial in the New England Journal uh, that I think really held the uh, administration, rightfully held the administration accountable for many of the failures that have led to now over 210,000 deaths. The United States has um, a, uh, a, a death rate of um, around 500 
uh, per million. Uh, this compares to the reported death rate in China, for example, where uh, we know there were the first outbreaks of three per million. Right? So uh, there have been, um, I think, really important failures, uh, massive failures of federal leadership here um, that uh, uh, I think could have, had they approached this differently, we would be in a different situation. And so reiterating, what are the ways that um, when it comes to improving testing and the monitoring, what are the specific steps that would help you do that better? Yeah, so, so uh, focusing more on um, uh, rolling out testing, so getting more, uh, uh, both improving what we have in terms of the clinical lab capacity, uh, available manufacturing of the tests themselves, uh, expanding the types of tests that we use, uh, developing, you know, there, there are a number, uh, uh, there's been a huge amount of innovation um, in developing new types of tests. Uh, and developing rapid tests. So tests where instead of, you know, with the current PCR test, it's, you know, at least eight hour turnaround and often it takes days just because of backlog. But there are some tests that are being developed that can do this, you know, within 15 minutes, half an hour or one hour, really trying to push forward and uh, the manufacturing and uh, the continued innovation of diagnostics, I think will uh, is, is a critical piece here. Uh, and then in terms of surveillance, many of the, uh, many public health departments have been underfunded chronically uh, and their infrastructure for information technology, for monitoring, for data analysis uh, and development of new plans continues to be hindered uh, by that long-term lack of funding. So investing in our public health system in developing new information technology uh, that cannot, can be both local, of use locally, but then of use more broadly, integrating data from across municipalities, regions, the whole country, uh, I think could be transformative. So given where we're at now, um, this question comes from Lexi Cohen. Do you think a place like Massachusetts, which was a national hotspot early on, um, has the potential to become a hotspot again and that a second lockdown, for example, would be necessary soon? Uh, I think any place that has the sufficient number of susceptible individuals uh, to sustain spread is going to be at risk. Right? It's basically that that's the determining factor for whether you could see spread. So uh, the possibility is there, but uh, I think in Massachusetts, there have been uh, many advances in developing uh, um, tools to help monitor and then respond to uh, increases in cases. And we're seeing that uh, take place as, you know, there's been a delay, uh, for example, in, in school opening uh, in Boston, um, and we'll have to see what, what other uh, interventions, the, again, Boston uh, city government and Massachusetts uh, uh, Commonwealth um, decide to enact if we see a continued rise. Should we expect to see a continued rise? I, I would say so um, for a couple of reasons. One, um, in areas where you have a lot of college towns, and Boston is one of those, um, we had an influx of people from uh, around the country. Uh, I saw an estimate that around 20% of university students in uh, the Boston area hail from California, Florida, and Texas, which back in late August, as these students were coming back to school for the start of the semester, were hotspots, right? So there's the expected introduction of cases Campuses are not hermetically sealed bubbles, right? They are uh, within our communities. And so as there start to be cases on campuses, we should then expect those uh, to appear in our communities. As we start to open up more and more uh, our schools where kids will interact with one another, families will interact, uh, and try to open up uh, other elements of the uh, economy as well, just have more opportunity for spread. Um, so as, as numbers get higher, uh, we would then expect to see um, continued spread unless uh, we have, again, um, uh, testing and interventions, uh, contact tracing and so on that can help um, with uh, efforts, isolation, quarantine to bring things uh, back down. This is another question from online building off of that. Um, but I mean, it sounds like colleges and educational institutions can play a role in driving outbreaks. 
Um, what are your concerns about how COVID-19 may spread differently during the fall and winter and how that might play into things too when you, you know, you talked about for at least on the East Coast and parts of the United States, people are outside and more distanced in the summer months. Yes, this is an important point and one I had intended to raise earlier, so I'm, I'm very glad for the question. From early on, there was um, uh, uncertainty about the extent of seasonality uh, of SARS-CoV-2. So uh, by seasonality, I mean variable transmission um, in the different seasons. For many respiratory viruses, we see higher rates of transmission in the colder months, fall and winter, and lower rates in the summer. We see that with the other coronaviruses that circulate uh, through human populations and cause common cold type syndromes. Uh, they have this kind of seasonal pattern where they peak in colder months. Influenza uh, similarly has this pattern. In fact, most respiratory viruses that we know of uh, follow this pattern. For flu, um, it's at least in part due to meteorological factors. So uh, lower absolute humidity is associated, as we see in January, February is associated with more transmission. But there are also behavioral features uh, as well. So again, for influenza, we know that kids are big vectors uh, of flu. And so as they congregate in schools and then go out into the communities, um, that, is a, that is a risk for, for accelerating transmission. And it is possible that that's going to be the case as well for COVID-19. So uh, both of the behavioral features is, uh, again, people spend more time indoors, uh, those behaviors that we were talking about that increase risk, being indoors, being unmasked, and so on, uh, those could contribute to uh, rising cases as we don't have the opportunities to be social outdoors as we did in the summer months. Uh, but then there, there may also be uh, other more biological factors uh, as well that we're not certain of. But I, I would expect, uh, in fact, we, we have every reason to expect based on what we see with other respiratory viruses that uh, there will be accelerated transmission in the colder months. Uh, some data, in fact, from the Southern Hemisphere uh, showed that as well. Uh, this question's from Kristen. It's about voting, actually. And sometimes people are waiting hours in close contact with other people. Has this been something you've looked at or thought about in terms of how the transmission risks of voting? Yeah, so, so I don't know details about, I haven't seen much of it. There may be some out there and I just haven't seen it uh, about what the circumstances are for voting. Certainly uh, your risk is reduced by, by masking, by trying to keep social distancing. And if the lines are outdoors rather than indoors, uh, that helps reduce risk as well. Uh, but I haven't seen uh, much data on whether, for example, voting in primaries led to, to outbreaks. We know that uh, there's, there's good data to suggest uh, that something like you know, an indoor rally like what took place in, in Tulsa was associated with a rise in cases subsequently in Tulsa. Um, uh, but I, I haven't seen uh, data suggesting as much for voting in the primary season. Um, this question is from the World's Facebook page. It's kind of now taking a more zoom out view, I guess you could say. At one point this summer, um, it looked like the US, Brazil, and Russia were the top three areas of concern, concern being top in terms of number of cases and deaths. What about now? Um, are those regions still of top concern? Um, and then what do you see as driving the spread of the virus in those places? I think it brings it back to some of the things you talked about at the beginning of the conversation. Yeah, I think, I think that that's right. I think, well, the U.S. leads the world in cases and deaths right, and continues to. And that, I think, again, is a, just a, a reflection of the failure of leadership uh, and the ability to put in place uh, um, sustained efforts uh, to help slow uh, or stop uh, the transmission of the virus. Brazil continues to have many cases. Uh, India has had many cases. And so there are a few areas of the world where we see uh, um, extensive spread. Uh, and I think in, in many cases, it, it gets back to this, um, this understanding of the types of activities that promote transmission, uh, having um, good uh, extensive systematic testing um, so that we can really identify cases 
uh, and then um, isolate the cases, quarantine the contacts, uh, and do what we can, what we know works in terms uh, uh, of interventions to, um, to, to stop transmission. There is one additional, big additional aspect to all of this, and that's the development of a vaccine. Um, and so if and when an effective vaccine comes into play, how does that play out? Because I know that um, you've been looking at, you and your colleagues, at this question of like, how do you prioritize what groups should get a vaccine first and, and how to then prevent more transmission, more surges, how to save the most lives. Um, what are you finding in that regards to that? Yeah, so vaccines uh, can have their effect in a few ways. They can prevent infection. Uh, they can limit the severity of disease if infected. Uh, and then they can limit the transmission of the virus. The vaccine trials currently are really focused on trying to understand limiting the extent to which the vaccines limit the severity of disease, uh, and not so much on trying to limit transmission. So I think, you know, in some ways, our, our, what we'll glean from these, uh, from these trials is how well vaccines can protect people from, uh, from dying or from developing severe symptoms. But understanding their impact on transmission is, of course, hugely important for uh, um, trying to limit uh, the extent of spread. Uh, both, you know, limiting both things, of course, is, is what we would like. What we were looking at was this question of um, if you had a vaccine that could achieve both, um, how would you distribute it, knowing that a vaccine initially at least uh, will be manufactured only uh, in sufficient quantities for a limited set of the population. So how do you prioritize vaccine distribution? Uh, if you want to reduce deaths, then uh, what we found, and this I think makes just common sense, is that you wanna target those uh, individuals who are at highest risk uh, for dying from the, from, from the disease. So the elderly population, for example. And this actually held true uh, even if the effectiveness of the vaccine is lower in those individuals. Uh, and I bring up that point because we know that for many vaccines like flu, for example, the effectiveness in older age groups is less than what we see in younger age groups. So even, even in that context, uh, vaccinating the at-risk population uh, first uh, will help reduce deaths. If we want to reduce spread overall, then vaccinating, at least as we looked at the numbers in the US, given our demographics and the kind of interaction patterns that we know uh, exist, um, that targeting the younger individuals uh, is how we should prioritize vaccination. Um, but uh, I think we recently had recommendations from the National Academy uh, where, again, they, they said prioritizing um, the uh, essential workers, healthcare workers, and then those at highest risk uh, for dying for the disease, from the disease um, is how we should prioritize. Uh, there are many, many logistical questions about how you implement uh, this kind uh, uh, of, of vaccination program. And I think those cannot be uh, overstated. I mean, both rolling out the vaccine, finding the individuals. For many of these vaccines, they're two-dose vaccines, so you need to uh, where people need to get doses two weeks apart. How do you make sure you do that? If people are in a few different categories uh, of risk, how, you know, how do you find them? If they initially aren't findable and you started giving vaccine to other people and then they decide to come back. I mean, there are many complexities here. Uh, I could go on and on, uh, but this is, I think, one of the big challenges our public health system is now facing too. Um, we're about out of time. Um, I wanted to ask you, if there's some certain driving questions as we wrap up the conversation that you're still trying to figure out, that you still don't know. And it sort of comes off of a question that just came in from Georgianne, which is what's the reinfection concern for the elderly who had the virus as they return to nursing and assisted living facilities? Um, so I wonder if in responding to that, then additionally, if you might be able to wrap up with some kind of um, key insights that you have in terms of like, we've learned so much, but also, being mindful of the things we still don't know. Right, and I think that question about how long does immunity last uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a fundamental one and totally critical to developing response. Um, and, and it's the same question, not only for natural infection, uh, but also for a vaccine. Um, does the vaccine confer 
uh, lifelong protection uh, against infection, um, or does it wane quickly, like what we have seen with other, uh, uh, like the common cold coronaviruses, where it seems like people can get reinfected a year after their initial infection. I think um, getting a better handle on the strength and duration of immune protection from both natural infection and from the vaccine candidates is, is absolutely uh, critical to shaping uh, a policy to come. And then finally, if you, as you think about the realities of people um, getting to work, trying to live their lives, but also managing these unknowns of the surveillance information that you're trying to get, the testing information, what are some of the key things that you've learned about how people can kind of manage these unknowns and try to prevent transmissions moving forward? Right. Um, this, this gives us an opportunity to, to underscore uh, those uh, issues we've talked about um, a couple of times where we, we know what can help lower the risk of transmission, uh, masking, uh, outdoor versus indoor activities, social distancing. Um, these kinds of efforts, uh, I think, reduce the risk of spread and are ones that we should continue to be mindful of. Great. Well, I think that's a good place to end um, to conclude our conversation, Facebook discussion. Thank you, Jonathan, for fielding my questions and everyone else's. Thank you for the fun conversation. Um, and so this Q&A has been jointly presented by the forum at Harvard's TH Chan School of Public Health and the World from PRX and GBH. You can view the full discussion on our Facebook pages and send feedback at forum HSPH and at PRI the World. You can join us again this Tuesday at noon when we will be talking with epidemiologist Caroline Bucky for the coronavirus pandemic and the latest updates approaching the holidays. Thanks for listening.